Hangout is live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Science Been the Sci-Fi. My name is Tyler Yo, and I am the creative director for Broken Crown Games. For those of you that have caught our episodes in the past, you'll know that usually what we do is we like to use these episodes to vet the science behind the science fiction of our universe. However, with this episode, we've got something a little bit special in store for you guys, and what we're going to be doing is vetting the science behind the simulation of this upcoming video game, Dinosaur Island. With that said, I'd like to turn things over real quick to my co-host, Katie O. Hey guys, it's great to be back for a second episode. So this week, as Tyler said, we're talking all about dinosaurs. So we have some really great guests on that can help explain to us a little about what maybe everyone doesn't know. First, we have Dr. Karen Chin. She is a curator of paleontology and associate professor of geological sciences at Colorado. Welcome, Karen, to the panel. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, can we actually, uh, what, what would you say you do on a daily basis? Well, I teach paleobiology, and, or, which is basically paleontology, and I also uh, curate fossils in our Museum of Natural History. And, for example, I'm in charge of, of one of the finest collection of fossil tracks and one of the finest collections of fossil eggshell. Wow, well, that is a mouthful, but that sounds really awesome and interesting. Um, second up for today, we have Dr. Jordan Malone. He is a research scientist in paleobiology at the Canadian Museum of Nature. So welcome, Jordan. Can you tell us a little Hi. bit about what you do as well? Yep. Um, so uh, I, I primarily do research uh, at the museum. Uh, I work largely on uh, late Cretaceous dinosaurs from Canada, but I'm also involved with things like um, exhibit design, uh, do an occasional bit of teaching, uh, and uh, the occasional bit of public outreach. Very cool. And third, and um, mainly the reason why this episode is slightly different than normal, we have Dr. Ezra Sidrin on with us. He is a visiting professor, a visiting associate professor, sorry, at the University of Iowa and the founder of Dinosaur Island. So can you, uh, Ezra, welcome to the panel and explain to everyone what Dinosaur Island is. Well, uh, Dinosaur Island is an extremely complex simulation of dinosaurs and their environment. And it's a 3D simulation. I've, I've done computer games for 25 years. I teach computer game design at the University of Iowa. And um, when I'm not teaching computer game design or creating computer games, I'm often uh, hired by the United States government to do in-depth simulations of various things. And I decided to take my experience in working on simulations uh, and apply it to dinosaurs. Uh, back in 1988, I did a game called Designosaurus, which was the number one selling game in 1988, educational game of the year. And uh, we did a very simple simulation of dinosaurs in their environment because computers were very simple back then. And it occurred to me that we could take advantage of all the new memory, fasting, faster processors, uh, improved video, uh, to do a 3D simulation of dinosaurs in their environment, and that's Dinosaur Island. And if you guys would like to see more about Dinosaur Island, you can visit his website at dinosaur-island.com. On that's there correct. you can also find out about um, his Kickstarter to help launch the game. So if anyone's interested, please visit his website and let's get this game started. So today, we get to talk about dinosaurs, which is so cool. Um, so I wanted to start off some questions with Jordan. So Jordan, can you tell us more on a broader note, what were some of the major periods of dinosaurs on Earth? And how do you determine when you find a fossil which period they were from? Um, well, dinosaurs, the, the, the time where we find dinosaurs, the age of the dinosaurs, we know broadly as the Mesozoic era. And we break that era up into three distinct periods, the, the Triassic period, 
the Jurassic period, which probably lots of people are familiar with, and the Cretaceous period. Um, and 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 so so broadly, uh, the Jurassic spans, uh, rather the Triassic spans from about uh, 250 million years ago to about 200 million years ago. Uh, the Jurassic spans from 200 uh, to about 100, uh, 150, and then the Cretaceous uh, spans from 150 to about uh, 66 uh, million years ago. Um, so we see dinosaurs. Uh, spanning just about that in, entire range up until their extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period and, and those periods uh, are characterized by different groups of dinosaurs. So, so when you find a fossil, how are you able to determine, oh, this was from that period or how did we, how did we figure out the differences for fossils? Well, generally, the, the, the beds or the, the rock strata that those uh, uh, fossils are found in have been dated to within those different periods. And so, for example, uh, well, to pick a popular example, T. rex, um, we find it in beds that date to between about, you know, 68 to 66 million years ago, thereabouts. And uh, we know that that time range falls within the Cretaceous period. Uh, so we know that it that it's, uh, belongs at the end of, of that Cretaceous period. So we and we can date those fossil those rocks rather based on. We don't typically date the fossils themselves. We date the rocks that they're found in uh, using uh, radiometric dating of of different types, be it you know potassium argon dating or or argon argon dating. Um, and that's based on half-lives and and you know long-established decay principles, and um, and we sort of fit those dinosaurs uh, within their stratigraphy or or the the rock layers that way. So, is is there any major differences that made those separations in time? Like, why? How would you go about and say this is when the Cretaceous is? Is there determining factors and uh, well, I mean, those those periods are are, are quite different. I mean, we see very different uh, lithologies and rock types and different types of plants and different types of faunas throughout uh, those periods. So, uh, in the uh, in the the Triassic period, for example, um, the Triassic starts off where a, a a giant mass extinction left off. So. At the end of the Permian and, and beginning of the, the Triassic, you've got a, a giant worldwide extinction. It's known as the Great Dying. It was the biggest mass extinction the Earth has ever seen. And at that point, you lose things like, well, most of marine life, including things like uh, Eurypterids, we call sea scorpions. You, you lose things like uh, trilobites. They look a bit like overgrown pill bugs. Uh, on land, you lose a lot of the, the mammal-like reptiles. And at the beginning of the Triassic, there's all these new niches that open up, and you see things like the earliest ancestors of, of dinosaurs and birds and crocs coming online. Um, uh, and towards the end of the Triassic, you, you actually get the first uh, mammals and the first dinosaurs evolving. Uh, you get the first examples of meat-eating dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus. You get the first examples of small plant-eating dinosaurs like uh, Pisonosaurus. Um, and and really, the the Earth at that time was quite different looking from what it is today. So all the the, the continents are amassed into a giant landmass that we call Pangaea, uh, and it's and the climate is quite warm. It's quite dry. It's a long story. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, going into the going into uh, the Jurassic period, about 200 million years ago, that continent starts to break up uh, into two giant land masses: uh, the uh, uh, Laurasia in the north, Gondwana in the south. Uh, you get the evolution of large body sizes in dinosaurs. So we see, you know, the biggest long-necked sauropods have evolved uh, towards, uh, particularly towards the end of the Jurassic. 
you start getting big meat eaters, big carnivores like allosaurs, I think we're all familiar with. You get the stegosaurs. Um, Fun stuff. Yeah, the you know the real typical stuff that I think uh, a lot of people are are are, are familiar with, uh, and then um, and then into the Cretaceous, the land masses continue to break up, sea level rises, things are quite wet, quite humid, uh, and the continents start taking on um, a configuration that we would be uh, more familiar with today. So the the Atlantic Ocean starts to open up. Uh, we see dinosaurs like uh, in Tyrannosaurus coming online. We see uh, duck-billed dinosaurs. We see horned dinosaurs. And then uh, at the end of it all, we see a, a giant mass extinction where we just basically wipe out all the, the, uh, the non-avian dinosaurs. We wipe out a lot of the marine reptiles like the mosasaurs. Um, so that's a very, very brief uh, and broad uh, scale overview uh, that, that sort of defines those different periods. I just like that you used in reference to some uh, dinosaur coming to life as they're coming online. It's such a nice and new technical way of being like, oh, and then they came online. <laughs> Maybe Ezra will appreciate that most as the, <laughs> the computer man here. <laughs> all right. Thanks for all that, Jordan. Um, so Ezra, Jordan and Karen are going to throw some awesome science at us, but I just want to grill you on video games. So with that said, Jordan's talking about Pangea, Gondwana. I'm pretty sure he said something about Middle Earth somewhere in there. <laughs> um, so really, I mean, he's got meat eaters, herbivores, all of that. So what I want to know is where is Dinosaur Island falling? Like which period are you covering in the game? Well, we're going to have three distinct, accurate time periods. So uh, we don't want... A lot, the questions I get quite a bit is, what dinosaurs will be available and, and, and will you be able to mix and match? And we don't want to be able to mix and match outside of their historical era. era. So for the Cretaceous period, we want to make sure that the dinosaurs that are in the Cretaceous period are, are actual, accurate dinosaurs for that era. So we don't want dinosaurs from different eras interacting. And that also ties together with everything that the simulation's about anyway, because we want the dinosaurs to eat the herbivores to eat the correct plants. And we've been working with Karen on that, so we know, for example, that the Edmontosaurus <coughs> eat uh, a certain type of plant called a Nipa plant. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I just know it's N-I-P-A. Um, and what they look like, and I've put them on the island, and so we know that these Dinosaurs will eat these plants. Um, and then we also know that the T-Rex will, <laughs> will eat the Edmontosaurus. So this is all accurate. And we want to make sure that, that we have this closed ecosystem where we have the correct carnivores and the correct herbivores and the correct plants. OK, awesome. So you plan on actually covering all the periods. So kind of Dinosaur Island could almost be described as one island is Pangea and one island is Gondwana, because they're each respective to their periods, right? You yeah, I wouldn't imagine it that way. Gondwana or Pangea, but yeah, each island is correct, and each island is very big. Each island is almost a thousand acres, just less than a thousand acres. So it's they're very big. Awesome. Yeah, and we model it. We actually have to track every plant on the island. So we track every... It's easy to track dinosaurs, but we also have to track every plant on the island because we need to know how much nutrition measured in joules come from that plant. So that's part of the whole model is how many plants, how much vegetation does this, does this Edmontosaurus have to eat to survive? And then how much uh, energy does the T-Rex get from eating so much of the Edmontosaurus? So we have to keep track of that every step of the way. How many joules of energy are produced from eating, consuming these resources? Awesome. So one quick curveball before I let you go. Um, yeah. So in some of the other big name simulations, you like SimCity, they would have earthquakes, yeah. and Oregon mm -hmm. Trail, you'd have typhoid or something like that. There's yeah. always that curveball that you get thrown in the game. Mm -hmm. Dinosaur Island, obviously, is a simulator. You're trying to play through that period. Um, yeah. And obviously, in real life, with Pangea, those dinosaurs, some of them made 
made it through those major um, events that changed. Yeah. You plan on having like those a major game breaking end scenario to any game like a asteroid coming in. <laughs> I don't not an asteroid, but something that messes with the environment. Sure, that causes that causes the user to make some major changes in fast thinking to, to keep his animals alive, to keep his environment going. What envi uh, ecosystems are are, are fairly um, well, they're they're balanced, and once you start throwing things off of balance, they 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 run out of sync real fast, and so you need to constantly keep them in balance, and you can do that by changing what plants a dinosaur can eat or changing what plants are available or changing things like that. But there's also these eco challenges that you're constantly being faced with in the game and you need to, to complete them. For example, it might be to take a herd of your, uh, you're, you're the leader of a herd of dinosaurs, you can actually get in and drive the dinosaur as we call it and it's your job to get it from one side of the island to the other to get fresh water and in between are is a hunting pack of T-Rexes and it's up to you to get your guys safely across the island to get to water. So that kind of stuff. And then if you successfully do that, then you get a reward. And that reward might be you get to improve perhaps the um, the uh, olfactory acuity, which is say can smell better of one of, your, of one of your species of dinosaurs or perhaps increase the angle of vision. Both these things are very important. Or perhaps you can actually uh, give your dinosaur some new AI routines. For example, uh, we've created an AI routine where the T-Rex uh, knows to hunt downwind. Now, we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever that T-Rex is new to hunt downwind, but this is an interesting idea that uh, the artificial intelligence can do. It can actually arrange so that the T-Rexes are smart enough to know where the wind is, know where their scent is, and to try to maneuver appropriately during their attacks. What that is a really cool concept to introduce into the game is almost um, I want to say not like a plug-in, but all these extra layers that then you can start using to yeah. make not more personal but more. Well, you can, personalize, you can personalize the dinosaurs too. You can actually name every dinosaur <laughs> and say, "Hi, I want to see Gertie," and Gertie comes <laughs> up. So you can name your dinosaurs as well. Yeah, and we're actually going to put an option where you can you can you can paint your dinosaurs as well. You can change them. You can change their colors. As an artist, that will officially be my favorite feature. <laughs> um, my my next question is actually for Karen. So I know that you're um, the curator of paleontology, and I wanted to know. Um, what were sort of the apex predators of those periods? The dinosaur that would just roam and be like the big man on campus. <laughs> I love that big man on campus. Well, if we're talking about the Cretaceous, which I is the is Ezra's first simulation, um, we're talking about the Tyrannosaurs, and the very last one. Of the the latest Cretaceous was T. Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and that was the apex apex predator that we all think about. A little bit before the end of that, there were some of T. Rex's ancestors <laughs> that were still Tyrannosaurs, but they were a bit smaller, and there were more of them, and so those were Tyrannosaurs. And when I say smaller, Maybe instead of having a four, four or five foot long skull, maybe their skull was only three feet long. <laughs> so they were still very large, very large dinosaurs with very large teeth. So they still win. Their whole family are kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, they were to be feared when they were when they were around. And I'd like to point out that they were carnivorous dinosaurs at the same time as the, the Tyrannosaurs were roaming around and they were apex. There were smaller, um, what we call theropods or small carnivorous dinosaurs. They were, uh, there were others around too. Some of those were maybe even person size. A little larger, a little smaller maybe, but they were certainly to be feared by some of the 
non-carnivorous animals that, that lived in the area, but they were certainly not as large as, as the Tyrannosaurs. So we know that, you know, the T-Rex and all these other big carnivorous dinosaurs, what we focus on mainly is, you know, dinosaurs eat dinosaurs, apex predator, you know, but there was a lot of um, plant-eating dinosaurs there too. So what I wanted to know is how do we know um, what plants the dinosaurs ate? How did we know that they were, you know, separated from these big apex predators that we like to envision in our minds. Well, I'm really glad you bring up the the plant eaters and the, the plants because oftentimes we tend to focus on the great big dinosaurs and you know they all eat each other and it's all exciting. But the base of the food chain in the terrestrial ecosystems are the plants. You have the plants that get energy from the sun and then um, consumers eat those and then the big apex predators consume the consumers. But there's far more herbivores than there are carnivores in any ecosystem because we have to get energy from the sun. Now what you ask is a very straightforward and important question but it's a really it's really hard to answer and what we are doing is we have to put our best guess forward. Most of the time we simply do not know the answers to these questions. Just like Ezra mentioned that we don't know if T-Rex positioned itself downwind, but if we think about modern predators, that's a very good a reasonable hypothesis. So um, with plants, what we first want to establish is which plants lived with dinosaurs. So there's a whole a whole lot of I shouldn't say that. There's a, a, a fairly small number of paleobotanists that work to answer questions like these and they look for fossils of plants which may be leaf fossils, they may be wood fossils, they may be pollen fossils, they may be flower fossils. All of these are actually paleobotany is challenging because all of the, these different fossils are usually found separately and sometimes you don't know if a leaf fossil belongs to a tree, a, a wood fossil or a pollen fossil belongs to a, a flower fossil because everything breaks apart. But they, they gather all this information and they can at least say, well, we know that certain kinds of plants were living at the time. And as Ezra mentioned, Nipa is a kind of palm and that is was very prevalent at the time and there are other plants that were prevalent at the time so even though we may not know for sure at this point in time if Nepo was a major food source it's very likely that it was a good food source and it's a good place to start if we were to try and figure out exactly which kinds of animals ate which kinds of plants. We have to use very various forensic techniques, well, sleuthing techniques, detective techniques to do that. And um, one thing, one person who knows a lot about that is our own uh, Jordan here who actually has looked at the beaks and the, the heights of various um, herbivores and can they feed on something like nipa or can they feed on lower plants or how there's a lot of technical things that you can go about looking at the body fossils what will that tell us about what kinds of plants these animals ate what I like to look at are what we call trace fossils and those are fossils that provide evidence of an animal's activity they can be footprints they can be burrows, or they can be things like what I study, which are fossilized feces, fossil dung. We call these coprolites. And it would be ideal if we could find a fossilized coprolite that, or actually lots of fossilized coprolites that could tell us who ate what plants. Unfortunately, fossilized coprolites tend to be very rare, and we often can't tell 
who produced them in the first place because they're not linked together in the fossil record. So oh, another way to find out what an animal ate, an even better way, is to look at, at gut contents. Unfortunately, those are really rare too. And one of my former students, uh, Justin Tweed, actually studied the contents of a, a large duckbill dinosaur and found leaves inside, but it was so poorly preserved we couldn't tell what kinds of leaves. And the coprolites I've looked at, we can see different plant organs and we can see things from conifers and some things from, from um, flowering plants, some things from cycad-like plants, some things from ferns, but again we're still trying to sort out exactly what kinds of, of plants these are. But I think if we use all these different kinds of, of pieces of evidence, what the dinosaurs look like, what their teeth look like, what the trace fossils tell us, then, then we're kind of getting into what we think um, these animals might have fed on. All right, I want to build off that, what you said in the very beginning. Ezra, everyone loves T-Rex, just like Karen said. Everyone wants to, when you think dinosaurs, you think T-Rex nowadays. Um, and with that said, if I'm playing Dinosaur Island, I want to be a T-Rex, and I want to eat stuff. No, actually, let me rephrase that. I want to eat everything. Could <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I jump in your game, jump into T-Rex, and just start devouring everything? Yes, yes you can, and you will get a very hard lesson in ecology uh, after you consume all of the food on the island and you too will die, and, and that's how it works. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing to stop you jumping, as we say, driving a T-Rex and driving around and, and killing stuff. Now, that said, um, there's lots of circumstantial evidence that um, a T-Rex could not just uh, walk right up to a, a large protected herbivore and kill it because, uh, and, and I don't want to walk too far into this because this is this is Karen and Jordan's area of, of, of research and expertise and not mine, but, but I've read that about one out of every four T-Rexes showed signs of broken bones and probably I assume from combat and I assume from from uh, trying to kill something that didn't want to be killed. And so I think that just walking around like Godzilla and trying to kill everything you see would be a very dangerous thing and eventually uh, your wounds would, would do you in. I think that a certain amount of uh, cleverness and attack even for a T-Rex, and I'm seeing this as we're running uh, Dinosaur Island and we're seeing these simulations that um, a T-Rex was just not like Godzilla or like some kind of first-person shooter where you just run around and kill everything you see. You need to be smart. You need to be clever. You need to be downwind. You need to be in a position where you can see your prey and the prey can't see you. Um, especially because, and, and again, this is Jordan and, and uh, uh, Karen's area of, of expertise, not mine, but most of these herbivores are, are in herds and uh, I assume they had some sort of defense systems, uh, mutual defense systems. Certainly some of them were very heavily armored and even uh, something like an Edmontosaurus which isn't particularly armored was really big and had a big tail and could certainly uh, uh, whack a T-Rex pretty hard and break a bone I would think. So uh, I think the key to being a, an apex predator in the Cretaceous was not killing everything that you could see but being very smart about your hunting. I, I think, I think and that's what the simulations I've been seeing in Dinosaur Island seem to indicate. All right, that actually makes me wonder something else. So you're saying if I'm a T-Rex, I need to act smart, think about the prey I'm taking, how I'm going to take it down. Um, yeah. With that said, kind of like Karen again pointed out, there's a whole, there's so much more to dinosaurs than just the apex predators. There's the herbivores and the plants that the herbivores eat and all of that. Um, and so with that said, um, could I jump in an herbivore and kind of, is there any intelligence to the actual herbivores? Like if I have them eat, again, like Karen said, we don't have a ton of evidence on, apparently from the poop and, <laughs> and the guts. There's just not a ton of evidence on what they ate. So I would assume it's very similar to animals nowadays. They eat certain plants and other plants are poisonous to them. Um, so 
is there do herbivores learn that? Like if I jump at an herbivore and have them eat a poisonous plant, will they die? And will other groups of their species not eat it then? Or how's that work? You, you can set that up in Dinosaur Island. You can set up what plants are nutritious for what herbivores. So you can say this herbivore gets nutrition from this plant. This plant doesn't do anything at all for this herbivore. So you can set that up. And that's one of the options you get in the game yourself as you acquire more ability, you can make your herbivore uh, be able to, to, to have a more diverse diet. And this will help you again. Uh, just as a T-Rex can eat all the herbivores on the island and then will die off itself, theoretically the herbivores can, can eat all the plants of one type. And that's, if that's the only thing they can eat, then they'll starve too. So this is why it's an ecosystem. This is why we talk about balance. You know, you have to balance everything down the line. And this is all about transference of, en of energy. And um, the simulations that I've done, and I, I don't know, this is maybe the 20th or 30th simulation I've done, I, I sometimes uh, refer to them as three-dimensional spreadsheets because we're all used to using Excel for one thing or another, doing our taxes or whatever. But you play what if in Excel spreadsheets. What if if this revenue is higher, then this thing can be lower, and we, we, we adjust things as we go along. It's the same thing with the Dinosaur Island simulation. We can adjust things so that if, the t if, we, if we dial down the amount of energy that a T-Rex gets per kilogram of Edmontosaurus flesh, it's going to need to eat more flesh and more often, and I remember I believe this was one of Karen's papers, though it might have been just a paper she directed me to. It seemed to me that T. rexes did not uh, particularly digest their food very well. They would just go through massive amounts of meat, and it would just go right through them out the other side. And, and maybe Karen can address that. But uh, I remember reading again. I don't remember if it was one of her papers or one she directed me to. That uh, they that. Uh, they found a coprolite of a T-Rex that was like five liters, and I'm thinking, that's bigger than my V8 engine and my Mustang. I mean, that is a large, large coprolite, and I, I think that means that, that the T-Rexes were not really digesting their food properly. <laughs> they were just, you know, ripping off big hunks, and it would go right through them pretty quick, so they didn't process it. They didn't get as much energy. Um, so that's another one of those what if things you can adjust in Dinosaur Island. What if what if a T Rex got more energy measured in joules, um, in millijoules and megajoules uh, per kilogram? This would uh, change everything. How often it has to hunt, and and how much it, it needs to hunt. That was a lot of information about Dinosaur Island. I hope everyone out there is listening to how many cool options you get and how many cool things you could do and make your whole wonderful, <laughs> wonderful dinosaur environment. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are going to take a quick break. Uh, not for the live viewers. You guys can sit right here. It will be really quick. But for anyone who's re-watching this, uh, we're going to go to a quick break and we'll be right back. <sighs> Definitely need some Red Bull. And we're back from break, just like that. So the first half of the show, we kind of introduced our panelists and this new game we're trying to promote, which is really cool, called Dinosaur Island. And uh, so for the next half of the show, we're going to get a little bit more in detail about dinosaurs. So Jordan, I'm going to go back to you for the first question. Um, so... Something I always wondered is beyond kind of like the basic skeleton and when you go into a big museum you see these big amazing structures of fossils recreating these dinosaurs and it almost gives you an illusion that that's what the dinosaur looks like. It's so engraved in your brain. It's just this bone, just hard, big, scary bone structures. But how do we know what they really looked like? How do we know what their skin color or texture or how they actually looked externally yeah that's that's a tricky uh, question to get at um, I mean as you say typically when we think of dinosaurs we think about their skeletons and and in all honesty for most dinosaurs we really don't know we don't know what they looked like but you get occasional 
fossils uh, that that can sort of fill in some of those details for you. Um, so, for example, you asked about skin texture. Um, we've got numerous examples now of of uh, dinosaur skin impressions. Um, so, for example, um, I work a lot on dinosaurs from uh, from Alberta here, and uh, a very common fossil, um, at least as far as skin impressions go, are skin impressions uh, from duckbill dinosaurs. Um, you know, uh, they're almost a dime a dozen as far as skin impressions go, um, and so we can see that some dinosaurs had, you know, non-imbricating or non-overlapping. Um, scales, they looked something maybe like a like a Gila monster. Uh, we also get uh, we also get feather impressions. They tend to be quite common uh, in China. Uh, everyone's heard about the small feather dinosaurs found in China. And these are found in uh, preservational environments that we call Lagerstattens. That is typically very fine grained uh, sediments that preserve a lot of detail and so we can see the details uh, of those soft tissues, uh, skin or feathers or what have you. Um, what, what else? Oh, you asked me about colors. Uh, by and large, uh, we don't know what colors dinosaurs were and you know, that was always the one thing I read in the books growing up was, you know, we can know a lot of things about dinosaurs but we'll never know what colors they were. Uh, but even that's starting to change. Uh, I mentioned the feathered dinosaurs. Um, it turns out that if you look at the, the, the preservation in, in those environments where those feathers are preserved uh, is so fine that uh, you're preserving microscopic uh, structures. And so for some of those feathered theropods that, that Karen mentioned, uh, you can zoom in on those feathers using uh, high magnification microscopes like SEM and you can actually see the cells and the organelles uh, used uh, that, well, that, that comprise those structures and actually you can go down to the subcellular level and find organelles within those cells called uh, melanosomes and melanosomes are basically uh, the pigment creating uh, structures of a cell. And we know in, in modern birds that the shapes of those melanosomes generally correspond to the colors that they create. And so if we can we can go back to the fossil record and see the shapes of those melanosomes in the fossil record and we can therefore infer the colors, the colored pigments that they made and in that way we can figure out something about the colors of the, the corresponding feathers and the dinosaurs. So just to give an example, uh, there's a dinosaur in China, small meat eating, probably flying, possibly flying anyways, a theropod called Microraptor, um, related to Velociraptor, which I think a lot of us are, are familiar with. And uh, we now know that it was probably uh, black in color, it probably had iridescent feathers, so think of something like maybe a, a crow or a raven. Uh, there's a small theropod, uh, feathered theropod called uh, Anchiornis, uh, and it also has um, black in its feathers. It's got a mixture of black and white, and we know that it had a, sort of a rusty red uh, head crest too. So it's through sort of exceptional fossils like that that preserve feathers or skin impressions that we can get some idea as to what these animals uh, look like superficially. I have a second question for you, but first, when you said you were getting those skin impressions or the um, impressions of what would be either their, their scales or their feathers or whatever was external, was, besides the feathers, was any of it what we had thought? Or is it all kind of this new open territory? I know this is a really quick question I'm just adding in, but... Yeah, you're ca catching me off guard with that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, partly, yes. I mean, once upon a time, we didn't think dinosaurs had feathers. And then once we started figuring out the dinosaur-bird connection, we suspected back in the 70s and 80s that that might be the case. And lo and behold, we were able to confirm that 
with the recent finds of feathered dinosaurs in China going back uh, about the mid 90s or thereabouts. Um, and, but you know, by and large, we thought dinosaurs for a long time were just these big scaly reptiles, and we do see that in the fossil record too. So maybe that's not surprising. But then again, I'm, I, I think of finds like recently. Um, there was a new find from a dinosaur called Edmontosaurus uh, here in Canada. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd found uh, skin impressions from Edmontosaurus before. It was this big duck-billed dinosaur, maybe 12 or 13 meters long. Uh, it had no crest on its head the way some duck-billed dinosaurs do. But we had this fortuitous discovery recently, uh, just this past year, showing... Um, skin impressions from the head and there's actually this sort of soft tissue crest on the head that we wouldn't have imagined uh, before um, knowing about the underlying skeleton there's no evidence of a of a crest in the skull bones it's only a superficial uh, skin crest so there are certainly you know surprises to be found even there and I suspect uh, there are lots more uh, along those lines as well That's very cool. I'm sorry that question just popped into my head when you said that you were you were actually getting those, and I I had to ask. Um, so real quick, I don't. I'm so sorry. I'm asking everybody to make your responses really short to fit in. Um, but Jordan, one more thing. Do you, how do we know about things such as like speed and strength of a dinosaur when that's something else that it's not there? You know, we have the skeletal structure for most dinosaurs that we know of, but we don't really have muscles. How do we know what makes them fast or strong? Uh, well, there's there's different things that we look for. Um, we, you're right, we don't see the muscles preserved, but we do know that muscles leave scarring on the bone uh, where they attach to the bone. Uh, so we can infer something about the size of the muscles uh, based on the size of the attachment scars. Um, you know, there, there are cavities in the skull that allow our, our adductors or jaw-closing muscles to pass through, so we can look at the size of those cavities to get some idea of the muscles that filled them. Uh, we look at things like uh, insertion points of those muscles on the bone. So we know, for example, that uh, in animals that are quick-moving, the muscles tend to uh, um, insert closer to the pivot point, say at the hips or at the knees. Um, so if we see those muscle scars occurring near the pivot points, we might infer that we're talking about a, a fast-moving animal. Uh, on the other hand, if those scars insert further away from those pivot points, we're probably talking about a slow-moving but probably a very strong animal. It's differences in leverage. Uh, we can also look at, at trackways just to finish up. Um, trackways uh, can tell you a lot about uh, dinosaur speed, so the farther away uh, the individual footprints might be, the greater the stride, and the faster moving that the animal was. So knowing something about, say, the stride length and the hip height of the dinosaurs, we've got equations that we can plug some of those unknowns into to calculate the speeds of some of these animals. So it's almost like a game of Tetris where you're finding all these clues and just seeing how they would fit together to make the whole puzzle. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, paleontology is very much sort of a, a cumulative case scenario when you're where you're taking disparate pieces of evidence, evidence, and trying to piece them together into a, a coherent story that you can then take that story to the fossil record and test it out with with more fossils. So, Karen, if we're able to figure out this puzzle piece of how they were and how they performed and what they almost looked like. Is there any way we can figure out how they acted or how they behaved with others? Um, I know in Jurassic Park the main thing is the raptors hunt in packs, so you don't, the one who looks at you forward is not the one that's going to come at you side. Um, how, do we, how do we go about knowing those things? Boy, that's another, that's another really intriguing question that we have to use your Tetris like every little clue helps and so we can try and figure out some of these things some from um, trace fossils for example Jordan mentioned tracks and sometimes when we see uh, 
lots of tracks together. We know that um, dinosaurs were, if if we can if we can establish that they were likely on the same plane and moving at about the same time, they might have been moving in in groups, um, aggregations. Maybe they were pack hunting, maybe they were just moving together. Again, we can get that information sometimes from um, the tracks. Sometimes we can get it from information like um, from the, the scene, the scene of the crime. Uh, some people have investigated uh, an example of a, a big herbivore, bones. And it was, these bones were all scattered around, and what you found among them were little teeth of a dinosaur called Diononychus. And it was a really interesting, it was like a crime scene that took place, oh, I don't know, 80, 90 million years ago. And what they found was not only did they have bones of the, the, um, the herbivore, but there are also bones of these carnivores, of the Dionychus. And so they put this all together and they decided that what it looked like was that more than one Dionychus attacked this herbivore. And in the process, in the battle, some of them were uh, at least one, I can't remember how many, but there were some, one or, one or more, Deinonychus that were killed in this battle, but it, they were ultimately successful because the herbivore died and was eaten. But this showed us all these little bits and pieces when you see all these teeth, because when dinosaurs fed, they actually, their teeth were not like ours. They were deciduous. They were constantly um, falling out. And most of the time when they fell out was when they were feeding. So you would see shed teeth when dinosaurs were actually feeding. So they, these Deinonychus were feeding on the herbivores, but one of their guys didn't make it, at least one of their guys didn't make it through. So these are the kinds of clues that we look at. These clues are rare, um, but we value them so much because they give us, it's like they give us a little snapshot of of what happened at that time, and so we we try to we try to put all these snapshots together to give us a better idea of what was going on. And this is why I think um, Ezra's Dinosaur Island is so cool because we have all these ideas of what might have happened, and we have little bits and pieces of information. But using his game, we'll be able to say, well, what if this, and and play it through. So I. I I do not know too much about um, how video games <laughs> work myself, but I'm intrigued because I think this will be this will be a lot of fun for not only the public but, but paleontologists to try and figure out what if. I, I want to, yeah, I want to jump in on that and say that exactly that's exactly what this is all about. What Karen said, and and I'll give you a, a classic case in point, which she just mentioned which is uh, we know or we suspect that, that a T-Rex was not sexually mature at least until its teens and I've seen some papers recently that might even indicate 20 years old so or older so again Karen and Jordan please feel free to correct me on this but if you have a creature that does not become sexually mature uh, for a number of years you need to keep this creature alive you can't get it killed off um, attacking um, the prey. So I think it needs to be much more conservative in its uh, attacks, uh, whereas the swarming approach seems to indicate, frankly, a, a, a species that uh, isn't going to live as long, is going to reproduce much earlier, and uh, uses a, a, a different type of uh, strategy for survival and reproduction, which includes having a lot of creatures with not a long life expectancy and that's totally different than having a species like a T-Rex where it has to live a long time it has to survive numerous attacks that's you know, just wanted to interject that real fast and I, I also I think that um, either Karen wrote a paper or she directed me to a paper where they found a T-Rex tooth in a Edmontosaurus tailbone so we that's how I knew that we could say yeah T-Rex definitely ate Edmontosaurus because there was a tooth well, we only have about 
10, just over 10 minutes left, and I do want to get to really um, my favorite question of the show. So in order to do two things at once, um, I wanted to know what your favorite newest discovery is in paleontology, if there's something exciting, if there's research going on, or if there's a new discovery, or if there's this theory that's going on. Um, but since we have, I want to get to everybody, if you can also, um, when it's your turn, tell us how to get a hold of you or see your work. So, um, Karen, would you like to start? Uh, if we can do it in about two minutes each, that would be perfect. So how can we get a hold of you, and what's your favorite new news? Okay, I am found at karen.chin at colorado.edu. And there's also, I have a very simplistic website on the University of Colorado uh, Department of Geological Sciences uh, website. Um, oh, man. There's so many discoveries happening all the time. And, and um, um... Um. <laughs> okay, let me just throw out a couple just I've heard in the news. They're not my favorite because there's so many, I mean, you can't have a favorite. Things just keep happening. And this is why when I teach paleontology or paleobiology, I have to keep up with the news because things just keep changing. I have to keep changing books because we get new information all the time. But just recently we found of um, one of my colleagues from Drexel University found one of the largest dinosaurs ever in the world, um, uh, a big sauropod from Argentina, and I think they called it Dreadnotosaurus or something like that. Um, so that or something like that. What's that? Wasn't it Titanosaurus or something like that? Oh. Uh, I thought I read that. It might have been a titanosaur, but it, the name is. Oh, Jordan, go ahead. It, it, it was Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus. Thank you. Dreadnoughtus, named after a World War One ship that I understand was so huge that they didn't think that anything could sink it. <laughs> and and Jordan, was it a titanosaur? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. So, that, so that's one, one cool thing. So, Jordan, uh, what about you? Where is the best place to reach you? And is there anything you'd like to mention that's going on right now? Maybe at the Canadian Museum? Uh, sure. Um, uh, well, you can reach me. My email is jmallon, J M A L L O N, at mus nature.ca. Uh, I don't have a website yet that where the museum is currently updating its uh, website, so I'll be. You can search me on there when it's ready. Uh, as far as uh, you know, stuff that's going on right now, uh, I can't think of any one study. I think there's just a lot of cool new um, technologies that I think are really exciting that are that are being used in paleo today. So things like uh, CT scanning uh, that's allowing us to get inside, you know, the heads of dinosaurs to look at their brains. Things like, um, uh, well, one th one thing that I do is I I, I look at uh, dental microwear to look at basically the pits and scratches that are left on dinosaur teeth as a as a result of their feeding, and that can tell us about how j uh, dinosaurs were using their jaws when they were feeding their mechanics. Tells us something about their diets. Uh, we can cut open dinosaur bones now and and look at their uh, their bone histology to see how these things were growing. So I think just the technology in general is what excites me most. That's pretty cool. So Ezra, why don't you go ahead and finish us up? Where can they find any and all information about Dinosaur Island? And is there anything new and fun, even about the game that you'd like to mention to us? Absolutely. Uh, Dinosaur-island.com, that's the place to go. And, of course, there's a link to contact me directly, Ezra, at Dinosaur-island.com. Also, links to Jordan's new papers and some of Karen's work as well. Uh, a whole development blog of the three years I've been working on this project. You can get in there and read about all the, the research we've done with links to all the papers and, and what the game looks like and lots of gameplay videos and all that good stuff. Uh, the most interesting paper I've re read recently, by the way, is um, the Spinosaurus paper that just came out recently. 
that said the Spinosaurus was actually uh, in uh, freshwater rivers, which uh, made a lot of sense to me because I always looked at the Spinosaurus on land and it just didn't look good on land. It looked silly on land, kind of flopping around with this big fin, and I thought it looked like it should be in the water. And now they said, hey, you know what? It was probably in the water most of the time and it ate fish. So that made sense. Uh, I liked that a lot. Uh, one of the nicest things about uh, Dinosaur Island is all the feedback I've been getting, and I've been getting a lot of fantastic feedback, and I don't want to use the term fan mail, but a lot of people are real excited, uh, not just obviously paleontologists like Karen and Jordan, but people like me that just love dinosaurs all our lives going, oh, this is cool, this is cool, this is going to be so much fun. So that has been really, really rewarding, and I make it a point to answer every email that I get. So. Uh, please feel free to email me at Ezra at dinosaur-island.com and I'll be glad to answer your questions. All right, and don't Ezra. forget, you can also find information for his Kickstarter on there. Sorry, Tyler. Oh, yeah. yes, his Kickstarter's please. on there, so don't forget, everybody, go and check that out and help us out. All right, thank, you Ezra, so much. thank you so much for letting us uh, use your game for one of these shows. Um, Jordan, Karen, thank you guys for joining the show. Um, we love your scientific knowledge on all this. Um, other than that, if everyone watching this can give us a thumbs up or just subscribe to our YouTube channel to see future Science Fan the Sci-Fi episodes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, I just wanted to say that, that being able to chat with uh, uh, Karen and Jordan is just like a little kid's dream. I mean, like everybody, you start loving dinosaurs at four or five and you want to be a paleontologist when you grow up. And I didn't become a paleontologist, I became a computer scientist and said, but just to be able to talk to Karen and Jordan is just insanely cool to, for me. So you made an old little dinosaur kid very happy. Glad to do it, thanks. <laughs> it was fun. Looking forward to playing the game. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>